Good day, and thank you for joining us. My name is Russell Hendrickson. I'm the CEO here at Practical Data Solution. Uh, today's webinar, Creating a Strong ROI for Enhancing Analytics. And joining me today is Ian Judge. Thank you, Russell. It's uh, great being here, and thank you for everyone for joining us today. For those who aren't familiar with PDS, uh, we're a healthcare analytics company, and we have 20 years of experience helping organizations with their visualizations, dashboarding, and data warehousing capabilities. And for the first half of uh, 2021, our webinars have been focusing on the changes that CMS has proposed this year and how it's impacted various areas of reporting. So you looked at things like revenue integrity, denials recovery, as well as RVU metrics. And all these sessions can be found on our website or our YouTube channel at PDS Healthcare. But today we're gonna to be focusing on, on how to build a strong ROI by enhancing your analytics. And Ian, so you know, talking about analytics, we showed this dashboard in our webinar last month where we were showing different types of visualization tools. And this is a you know, fairly standard web-based visualization that's fully interactive. And one of the things that we talked about last month was having good analytics to you know, look at things like revenue versus expenses against our budgets and the importance of having timely analytics, especially when the pandemic hit last year. You know, we had a lot of organizations where expenses started to exceed revenue given the fact that we had to cut back on patient volumes. And so this webinar, kind of a follow-up to the last one where now we're not just talking about the tool, but we're talking about how to generate an ROI, how to calculate an ROI, and how to justify moving forward. And that's really the goal for today's webinar. And so as we think about analytics, you know, one of the things that run up is people say, we don't need more analytics. We have a lot of analytics. We have practice management analytics. We have data warehouses. We have all these tools. And yet still organizations at times seem to be struggling. There are gaps in performance. And our whole business here, Practical Data Solutions, is helping organizations with better analytics to close those gaps. And so we like to think, you know, as you're looking at justifying analytics, are there areas where we can do 20% of the work and get 80% of the results, or saying it a different way, are there areas where we could invest, say, 20% of the expense, and yet turn an ROI of, say, 400%, three, four times, and if we do have that opportunity, then, you know, potentially we should look at adding tools or technology. So when we're talking about calculating ROI, we are subtracting the gains of the investment by the cost of the investment, and then dividing it over by the cost, and you'll get your return on your investment. What you don't see here is that the time frame of the ROI, which is important to keep in mind as well. And now that we talked about calculating ROI, let's talk about why we should calculate it. Well, if we were to calculate the return on the investment for a project and it yields a high return, that perspective shifts from if we should do it, but rather when we should do it. And the second reason is that significant research has shown that when ROI is the focus of a project, the likelihood of that project succeeding is higher the main reason for this, we can directly go to uh, Robert Kaplan saying of, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. So what's our best practice recommendation for ROI? You know, and so when we work with organizations, the first thing we want to say is if you're considering moving forward with a project or an opportunity or potentially new software or tools, right, what's the value? What do you hope to gain? And so, of course, that's typically where people start. We know we have a problem. W what's the benefits? And so we can document, we can anticipate the benefits, i.e. we're going to cut staff costs, we're going to have better information, we're going to be able to measure these metrics that we couldn't measure before. In anticipating the benefits, we can then start to calculate out what we expect to achieve as an ROI, and we're going to step you through that. And then ultimately, once you've moved forward with your project, it's really important to measure the results after the fact. With our first case study, this particular client was a 70 provider medical group and they had two dashboards that are being built utilizing Excel. And it took them 16 hours a month to build for the organization. And this really created a strong need for a tool that could automate reports for them. So we talk about anticipating the benefits. The primary benefit that the organization was looking at was they were looking for automation of dashboard creation with a goal of less than one hour. They felt that by being able to produce their dashboards in an automated fashion, they could pull almost all of the staff time out, save about 15 hours per month. But there were additional benefits beyond that. There were other dashboards and metrics that were needed. They also wanted to move to being able to produce weekly and daily dashboards, being able to give the physicians more timely information on their productivity. They also had the challenge by, 
by producing dashboards manually, there was, there was a lot of errors at times. And then ultimately, they felt that through the other benefits, being able to do more reporting, they would see a benefit of somewhere between 60 and 80 hours per month. So let's go ahead and walk through then how do we get to the ROI. The tools that they were looking at was PDS Dash. And what PDS Dash does, if you're not familiar with our uh, automation tool here, it allows us to pull data from different analytics and reporting tools. And then data can be pushed or automated into Excel, but we don't have to worry about the formatting of Excel. This is really to just get the data out that needs to be blended or joined. Then through the Dash tool, we can automate building out position dashboards, blending data for department or specialty dashboards. And so this was the kind of solution the organization was looking at was, you know, what could they do with a tool like Dash? And this is representative of the metrics that they're reporting on. They were able to blend various metrics onto one dashboard to get a more holistic view of the practice. They added appointment status metrics to see the rate in which patients are coming in. You could also see uh, work RBU charts to look at productivity from the prior year to the current year to see if they're trending uh, positively or negatively. And then they blended all of these metrics together with uh, patient satisfaction scores to ensure that the provider is delivering the best care for their organization. One of their other dashboards had similar metrics to what you see on the page here, which was they were looking at both revenue and expense, and they were comparing them to budget with the goal to really understand by different specialty or practice exactly how they were performing and how they were performing against their targets. Now that you saw the benefits of enacting analytics like this, let's estimate the financial benefit as well. Looking at the primary benefit, let's assume that the staff's hourly rate for an analyst would be $50 an hour, including overhead. Now that they have on this tool, the 16 hours they were working on to build dashboard has reduced to one, which would save the organization $750 in monthly savings. Then looking at the additional benefits, 70 hours times $50 would yield 3,500 in monthly benefits, and then keeping account of the investment costs having upfront training of $4,400 and a $600 monthly fee for our practice that size. So now if we go to look at actually calculating the ROI, we add the total gains in the first year. Um, we're going to do it on an annual basis. So we have 51,000 in uh, savings and staff time and other benefits. We have first year costs of the 4,400 in training and the monthly license fees of 11,600 and we calculate our first year ROI of 340%, which is fairly consistent with what we see when we implement PDS Dash. What I like to do though is not just look at the ROI, I like to think about the risk. And so I also always try to calculate where's the break even? At what point if we implemented the solution can we say after the first three months, every month we use the tool, the solution, or the new process, we're now generating a positive return. To go a little further, though, we could also think about that as the risk. What if, we, what if our estimate of the savings is wrong by, say, 50%? We're still going to see a return, a break-even within four months. So after four months, we've got a return. Or even if we go to 20%, what if we're 80% wrong and we can't get you know, as much uh, automation as we think? We're still going to receive a return within seven months. In addition, if we calculate the second year ROI, because we now don't have those first year costs of the 4,400 in training, the second year ROI skyrockets to you know 600%. So pretty good return here. Now looking at our second case study, uh, this case study is similar to the first one, but this client's challenge is that their physician compensation dashboard that they're creating took four days out of the month to create with the potential for errors. And on top of that, it took the analyst several hours to um, push those dashboards out manually via email. It took them on more than half a day to send them out. So again, thinking about what's the primary benefit, the organization was looking to reduce building compensation dashboards from four days down to one day. And why not you know, fully automated? Well, what they found was that they knew their comp plan had a lot of unique variations. There were, in some cases, a lot of one-offs for each individual physician that might be on sort of nuances to their comp plan. And so they knew there was still going to be some manual inputs. But they felt if they could re reduce from four days down to one day, and there's our sort of 80-20 rule, they could eliminate manual errors in comp, which are critical, you know, especially when it comes to paying uh, physicians and salary. And then they also wanted to be able to post the dashboards online so physicians had access to them anytime they wanted to just click on a web link. 
Some of the other benefits was they also wanted to do supporting reports for RVUs and collections on a daily basis, and they, they didn't have the staff or the time to do that. They, they also wanted to make their dashboards more visual and easier to understand and that the physician could understand their performance. And so conservatively, they estimated they could get another 60 to 80 hours per month in cost savings. So let's take a quick look at the solution and the tool set here. And so what we had proposed to do, in addition to using the PDS Dash tool that we just showed you, we also brought in the PDS Web Portal. And through the portal, the physician just could just click on a link. It would automatically authenticate them in. They could click and open up their physician comp dashboards. And so through Dash, where they were publishing the reports and through Portal, the physicians now had a, a very simple explanation of the plan. The dashboard creation was automated. It was showing them that they were on track for the third tier, which was this conversion factor to their salary and their bonus. And then you could also see that we were able to add in and help them publish clinic goals and how they were performing with some additional charts and graphs. And ultimately, they could see here's how much money is due for this period and how much have I earned year to date. If we take that further, we won't step you through all the ROI calculations, but if you take the cost of the solution against the staff time saved just on staff time, we're looking at about a 76% ROI, which isn't bad. But what you really have to start to factor in, and we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go, is what if we can improve performance? What if the physicians, now that they have timely supporting RVU information, they can see their comp reports, they can understand the levers as things are occurring each week and each month. If just 20% of the physicians increase their RVUs by 5%, or another way of saying that would be if all the physicians improved, let's say, 1%, right? The first year ROI skyrockets to 650% with a two-month break even. Now, what's interesting when we talk about this, and, and Ian mentioned this earlier, by focusing on productivity and by focusing on our ROI, right, what we've seen most organizations, when you start putting information in front of the physicians and showing how they're performing, it's not just the bottom performers who improve. Typically, all of the performers improve. And so to see a gain of anywhere between 5 or 10% in RVU production, uh, if an organization isn't putting this information in the hands of physicians, is not at all unusual. So in the addition of um, the two case studies we've just seen before, uh, the potential for ROI could be found in many ways. The ROI could be found in increases in revenue profit, efficiency, and patient satisfaction scores. And like our first example, if a provider is aware of their RBU trends and able to be more productive, that has a direct effect on the organization's revenue. Reductions in costs, time errors, and risk can also impede on organizations' costs. A great example of this is with denials recovery. Being able to reduce denials has a direct effect on the time it would take to rework those payer claims. Additionally, improvements in productivity. By uh, automating reports, it really cuts down on errors and can improve the quality of the work that's being made. And then lastly, additional analytics can start the creation of new strategies, processes, and insights for the organization as a whole. So let's talk about our third case study now, which is really providing self-service analytics for leadership. And this is a common area. And of course, we're, we're stepping into a next level of you know, thinking about the benefits to an organization. We've seen this time and time again. Recently, we just had another customer sort of sign back on board with PDS, very much so because the leadership found they couldn't get to the analytics they need themselves. They couldn't you know, write their own reports. They would have to either send an email or call somebody and say, this is the data I need. I'd like to see a report on this information. Then that would have to be you know, written. The report would have to be written by a DBA sent back to the leadership. When the leadership finally got it back two, three days later, they would say, oh, now that I have this, I need more information. Or what you gave me didn't include or exclude something that I needed. They would have to go back again. And so this back and forth of sort of not having timely information meant leadership was often having to make decisions without good data. They couldn't wait as long as it was taking to get the answers to the questions they were asking. So what the client was looking for was analytics that allows leadership to self-service 80% of their analytical needs themselves and then have their analysts gain better tools to assess leadership faster and more efficiently than ever. Additionally, they were looking for the ability to have those routine reports delivered automatically rather than manually, the ability to ask questions of the data and receive results in seconds, and finally, the ability to manage information. 
overall the organization was looking to streamline their process. So let's take a look at the analytics that the organization uh, put in, which is a PDS and power solution. And so what you can see here on the screen, in this case, it was focused around revenue cycle, where they had you know, various uh, capabilities to look at R RVUs and utilization, scheduling, AR, reimbursement, denials. But it wasn't these sort of visual dashboards that could be point and click and drag and drop. You know, that wasn't the focus. What they really wanted was the capabilities behind the dashboard, which was the ability to be able to self-service. And so you saw, I just went from the dashboard, I click right on the screen, and now I'm in what is an OLAP technology or a cube that allows me as the user to just slice and dice right through data, make changes in seconds on the screen, and I can even add or enhance different metrics that I want to see in the report, and it's happening real time. To go a little further, in addition to being able to sort of slice and dice right through data, if I just point and click on a particular month or period, I can even drill all the way down to the detail, the patient detail behind the numbers that you're seeing on the screen. And so what this allows me to do then is I can self-service my own reports. I can do 20% of the work and get 80% of the answers myself without having to go to an analyst, without have to, having to ask questions. And you know, ultimately then that's also going to free up the DBAs and the analysts to be doing more analysis or potentially to be working on the sort of more involved types of analytics that are you know, challenging or involve blending data. So you know, from here, detail, back to cube, back to dashboard, this was the type of solution that the organization was looking for. And what's the return on investment for uh, having self-service analytics like this? Well, if we were to assume that there is 20 users that self-service their analytics and they each make one request a week, the average savings will come out to be six hours per request. And having 80 requests um, multiplied by the six hours per request would give you 480 hours per month. And the investment coming around 8,500 a month you would get a 12-month ROI that averages over 600%. Yeah, a couple of things I'd like to point out here. You know, as we were breaking down the, the ROI, if you look at 480 hours per month, it's almost exactly three FTEs, which is kind of an interesting thing. So here, by investing in self-service analytics, it's the equivalent of gaining three FTEs of staff time, which is very interesting. The second thing I want to point out, though, is we're solely focused on staff analyst time of getting information. When we think about what if management could better focus on where we have you know, denial challenges or we're not dropping charges fast enough to get them billed or we're looking at accounts receivable and which AR areas that we're, you know, we're struggling with, right? that information allowing you to make better decisions just continues to drive the ROI up significantly. Let's look at our fourth case study. Our client here wanted to use HCC scores to improve their quality and better capture their revenue. So uh, this client's leadership knew that there are gaps in their revenue um, due to the pairs not accurately calculating risk scores and payments. And the quality team knew that the patient care was outstanding. So they wanted to use their own reporting uh, to get to the bottom of this and maximize their revenue. So, you know, it's kind of interesting because the organization really felt they were doing a good job with quality and managing their patients and managing their patients uh, with HCCs. So they knew their EHR, they had a pretty good software package that was telling them, you know, what conditions they should be treating and overall were they doing sort of the right protocols. But the organization knew, and this is kind of the interesting thing, that what's in the EHR is not how the payer sees and calculates the risk score. So when you think about all of the different data paths and the challenges that can occur, Right? So the EHR then oftentimes has to go through coding. The coders have to interpret that to get it published, and then it's sent over to billing. Through billing, we might have claim edits that hold up claims or claims that maybe never get out because maybe we missed a step in the process or there's some human, human error. Once we leave the practice organization, that data then flows over to the clearinghouse. We've seen issues where sometimes the system that we're billing from in the clearinghouse may be truncating or dropping diagnoses. Okay, then the clearinghouse is going to bundle up your data with potentially other organizations' data and send it over to the insurance company. And the insurance company's software that's receiving the claims and adjudicating claims is often really focused more on payment. Okay, claims could get denied and sent back that eventually are written off. We might not see those in a risk score. And then even the software the insurance company uses to calculate risk score might be a different module or in a different group or department. And so there's a lot of different potentially 
fail points that that what's coming back from the insurance company that risks are maybe incomplete. Yeah, so uh, when those payers send those risk scores over to the practice, the client wanted to compare this report to their practice's HCC report to reconcile any gaps that the payer may have just to ensure that they capture that additional revenue. So if we think about where does a PDS solution come in and why would this generate an ROI, right? So here at PDS, our HCC revenue capture product pulls the data from what's going into the billing system that visits CPT diagnosis code data, which is, you know, in essence, what's been coded, sent out. From there, we can, counter the, we can calculate the patient's encounter HCCs, so we can calculate for every visit the patient had, what was the HCCs tied to that visit. We can then roll that up to create a total profile of the patient, what HCCs they have, which are primary, which are secondary. From there, we roll that data up into what is the risk score, which can then be compared period to period to start to understand if we had missed something in our diagnosis that would affect the HCCs. And ultimately, then we can slice and dice through that data, look at it by payer, look at it by provider, and then, of course, drill down when we see gaps to understand where in our process are we missing things. The key here is we're doing this off of the billing data, not off of the EHR. And that's a little different than what other companies in the marketplace tend to do. And this was the specific area the organization saw they had a need was to really catch and make sure they were getting paid for the work they were doing. One of our customers that's using risk scores found that just one of their payers, the gaps between what the payer was saying the organization did and what they knew they had done using their own reporting was approximately 15%. When they went back then and calculated that out, they were able to show the payer they had done the work through their own reporting tools. That resulted in over $280,000 in additional revenue capture. That was with one payer. Okay. And to go a little further, this tool will also catch if there is a quality gap in your EHR or in the process. So there's kind of other secondary benefits. We've seen at PDS here organizations leveraging this revenue capture software, typically a 600 to 1200% first year ROI. Uh, and that's in particular because especially if you have any Medicare Advantage type plans or any capitated plans, the revenue associated with not getting these scores and diagnoses coded correctly is significant. So now let's talk about some uh, common objections we normally hear when we talk about changing or enhancing analytics like the case studies we just talked about. Russell, uh, what would you say to an organization that's saying they're going to build the analytics they need internally? You know, and that, that's probably the one of the more common ones we hear, well, we can build it internally. And I say we can build it internally. Okay, so if there's a performance gap, and there's potentially an ROI or an opportunity cost because you're not delivering to it. What I always ask the question is, okay, if somebody's going to build it, is there a commitment for a deliverable? Is it we're working on it or we've been working on it? Well, if you tell me you've been working on it for a year, the question then is, can you get there? But really the bigger question is, is there a commitment date for the deliverable? Because if you tell me you're going to have it in three months, that's a little different than we don't even know when or if we can deliver it. The second is, and this really relates, if, if we're going to have it in six months, what if we fail? What if we don't deliver internally? There's that opportunity cost, right? So we can measure if we don't have better reporting with the same kind of ROI thinking that we, if, if we get better reporting. And then the third area I'd say is, does the internal team have the experience? You know, so sometimes organizations think if we just put enough bodies on it, we put enough resources on it, if we hire enough people, we can get there. But, you know, we know analytics and it's in particular data modeling can be tricky. So those are some things just to consider when evaluating your ROI is what's the cost if we can't get there versus, you know, potentially working with a vendor who has proven experience. Speaking of time, Mo, uh, what if we heard uh, we don't have the time to change or enhance their analytics? Yeah, hear this one too. We have some older analytics and we just don't have time to migrate, to change, to upgrade, right? And so the reality is even though you, you may say, well, we've got something that's working, there's still an ROI of not changing. You still can measure what are the gaps and if we were to move to a new tool, you may have to factor in the cost of change. So you're right, it may take more time. You may have to pay over time. Maybe you need to bring in you know, some temporary resources to help you through the change. Those are costs, right? But tied to not thinking about changing and, and the pandemic I think really highlighted, 
when a lot of our, you know, um, the way we treated patients and then our revenue cycle really took some major changes with all of the things that went on with, with patient care and the inability to sort of see patients the way we were used to, a lot of analytical tools broke. What I mean is sort of the standard reports that we were kicking out that we might have developed over the years stopped working. And so there's always that risk of when we have a lot of change or there's some big disruptors to our organization, not having flexible tools, there's a real cost to that. And we saw that with the pandemic. Another objection we hear quite a bit is that the organization's uh, new EHR system will give them everything they need. What are some questions you might ask that organization? You know, I, I like the optimism of this thinking that, you know, we're getting something new and it's going to do everything we need. Uh, but, you know, the reality is that even if you're getting a new system and even if the system can do everything you need, you know, I go back to think about timing, right? So we're getting a new system next year. Is that six months or is that 12 months or is it not defined? The second thing, though, and this is a big thing that a lot of people miss is, especially when it comes to your revenue cycle in particular, you're still going to be likely running charges or running payments and collecting AR out of the old system. And we've seen larger organizations can take 12 to 24 months. So when you start to think, well, we're getting a new system next year, when's it coming in? Oh, about a year from now. And then you add to that, but we're still going to be using the old tools for at least another year beyond that. So now we're talking two to three years. Well, a lot of times, and to go further, a lot of times you've got, so now we have an old solution in place for the next three years. We know there's a performance gap. The new tools are going to come in, but we're still going to have to reconcile the new system and the old system. So a lot of times people miss. They think, oh, as soon as the new system comes in, we're going to get everything we need. And, of course, there's a major change when you sort of change your EHR, your billing. There's major changes that go on in the organization. In some cases, you're changing operational process. So not having good analytics through that change period often can be in its own ROI. The other question, though, I would bring up, too, is if, if you really think and you've been told the new system is going to do what you need, talk to some of their customers. Ask the questions about the performance gaps you have and make sure they agree the new tools do them and do them well. All right, let's talk about our fifth case study, which was denial recovery analytics. And we've seen this, again, you know, through many organizations. Um, this was a, a large health system. And they found that every time they thought they had their denial rates under control, you know, and they would push them down, they would bounce up, and there was another area that they were sort of missing or they needed to focus in on. And then the other piece of things that they were really looking for was they, they did not have a good handle on when they got a denial, were they ever getting paid. And so the solution they looked at was uh, PDS's uh, denial recovery, where they could measure the denied charges by month or period, and they weren't double counted, and they matched the charges back to the original build period. So in this case, when we're looking at July, January's charges, uh, denied charges, that might have been billed in November or December. Okay? The second thing was they really wanted to focus in on payments after denial and being able to understand all the way down at the procedure level, were they recovering payments, when were they recovering payments, which payers were they recovering from, and which payers were they not recovering from. So being able to organize staff time, focus work cues around where can we actually collect money and where are we never collecting money had major, major efficiency um, to the organization. The other thing, which is really interesting when you think about denials, is it's very quantitative. And because of that, you can actually build ROI calculators on the performance potential performance improvement with denials or even build in once you have tools like PDS that show you what is the performance improvement and where should you continue to focus? So this is one of our performance opportunity dashboards and it's showing the denial counts, the denied charges, the denial rate, and then the recovery rate of charges using the analytics I just showed. Okay, and this is just what happened, activity, or what's currently happening. And we're looking at it for one department and the various locations within the department. We can then measure through our reimbursement tools what is the clean claim rate for charges. So when the claim isn't denied, we're collecting 54% of a dollar. When it is denied, we're only getting 28. We can also then blend in the staff time cost by taking a blended cost of the people who are working and reworking the denials. Right? So we can now bring in some external data points. Then we can calculate what if. What if we just reduce denials by 5%? If we can reduce our 
uh, denial rate, there's a cost savings just on rework cost. Interesting area to look at. Or what if we can move all of the locations that have denial rates that are higher than the division here, 13.6, if we can move them to 13.6, where might we see additional dollars in savings there? Right? Going on the other side, if we could get everybody to move up to the division recovery rate, so all of the different locations that are recovering less than 28%, if we could get them to 28%, we see the ROI jumps, because now we're really starting to say, what if we perform better? What if we perform at least at the median of the department? And ultimately then, if we were to go further and say, can we get denial recovery to be closer to our clean claim rate, right? There's a significant jump in ROI again. And that's really where we start talking about performance improvement versus just staff time. Typically, denials is such an impact on an organization when you look at how many charges you're billing and that you know, even a denial rate of 15%, um, small improvements tend to yield very large ROI. So you may have seen a graph like this. It was coined by Thomas Davenport, and it measures organizations at uh, different stages of analytical growth. Every organization starts with uh, data summarization showing um, things like what provider has done for the month, and the revenue generated for the quarter, things of that nature. And then you may grow into uh, trend analysis. How do these summaries uh, compare from the past month or the past year? And then you go into something like benchmarks. Uh, what does the output look like against our market? Are we uh, below the benchmark? Are we above? And how can we change that? And then as you grow and mature, you get into the upper levels of things such as relationship analysis. Are there any correlations in our data metrics or patient access affecting our productivity? And then lastly, uh, we have our projections. Like Russell's been talking about, if we improve by 5%, what does the impact look like for our practice? And as you move and mature in your data, the need for analytics grows with it as well. You know, so what's interesting about this is we've worked with organizations, and I've been doing this, you know, 21 years now this year. And when, when organizations say to me, what's the ROI on sort of staff savings? What we find is down here in, you know, staff savings, automation type ROIs, typically, you know, 15 to two, 50 to 200 percent, depending upon the tools and depending upon how much labor they're spending in the organization. So a good ROI, but not quite in larger numbers. When we start to move forward and saying, well, can we trend data, right? So ROI from trending data, improving decision making, we're starting to get into better decisions mean more savings, more opportunities to improve our performance. You'll see the ROI jumps a little bit. But just like analytical intensity, when we get up to benchmarking, which is really how are we performing against where we could be or should be or others are, or do we correlate different relationships? When we get up to benchmarking, you'll notice the ROI on average tends to jump, right? So poor performance improvement, and that's because now we know we're underperforming. We can identify where those underperformers are, like you just saw in the denials example, and we can really measure if we can get to a better benchmark, we'll see more ROI. And interestingly enough, and we've seen this, but I found a, a couple studies that support this. When we start predicting outcomes using analytics to improve performance, that's where we see very large ROIs. And a perfect example would be if we can reduce our denial rate by 5%, or if we can better recover when we get denials, or focus the staff who are working denials to only focus on those high value denials that we can recover quicker, you know, and then projecting how do we improve performance, right? So that's where we tend to see the largest ROI gains. So with all of this, if you're still unsure of your um, the ROI of adding analytics, here are a couple of things that you can do and when you're thinking about adding a new project. First would be to speak with references. Many organizations have people that can champion those, those analytics and can explain the ROI when utilizing that product. Second would be to look to see if Pilot is an option. And then lastly, assessing the opportunity cost of adding the analytics versus the potential ROI of adding that, those analytics. And some key takeaways from this webinar, they can learn that analytics has one of the strongest ROIs compared to any other healthcare software, so don't be afraid to measure it. Second is that it's important to view analytics as an asset rather than a tool. Hopefully uh, with this webinar, you've seen that analytics could be a strong investment to our organization. 
Yep. We talked about this, calculate an ROI, but then reduce it to the minimum gain. So we think we can get, you know, 100 hours in staff time savings. Well, what if we only get 50? What if we only get 30? Is there still enough ROI to justify, you know, if we're unsure if our estimates or the gains expected can be obtained? And of course, any company with proven products can certainly assist you in calculating ROI. ROI does vary by client. It depends on what you're doing currently, where are the gaps, but any company with experience, if they can't help you get to an ROI or identify the benefits, um, you know, that, that alone is, a, is, you know, worth checking into. And lastly, after implementation, uh, measure the ROI. Our uh, best practice customers can quantify the ROI on past projects. So now they have the capital to pursue future projects now that it's been proven already in the past, which is uh, really critical for organizations. Yeah. It's certainly much easier to ask uh, for additional budget when you can show the last time you asked for budget, you <laughs> yielded a significant return. And I, I would say, you know, our best practice clients, they certainly would echo that statement. Thanks so much. Be well. Thank you so much. Uh, everyone take care. Right. Have a great day.